Broadcasting live from the treasure vault on the prime material plane, this is Tap Tap Concede. Welcome everybody to Tap Tap Concede. My name is Graham and joining me is Nelson. Hi there. And Cameron. Hi. And today we're going to be talking about Adventures in the Forgotten Realms Limited and a little bit about a couple of bannings in two wildly different formats. Hooray! But first, a reminder that this show is brought to you by Card Kingdom. Please check out cardkingdom.com slash LRR for all of your card needs. They'll ship you singles anywhere in the world. They'll ship you older sealed product anywhere in the world and newer sealed product anywhere in the U.S. And if you tell them Loading Ready Run Sent Me button, please, they will give you a little one-inch button, which currently says, Big Oof, mm. spelled O-U-P-H-E. Oh, I was about to say you can use that button somewhere other than magic, but I guess we kept it. We've got it, you know, squarely inside of our world. Yeah, it's definitely very inside baseball. And our podcast is also brought to you by you, everyone who supports us over on patreon.com forward slash loading ready run. Thank you for your continued support. Yes, and thank you to the folks who corrected me on our last episode where i referred to i don't know what land it was i think it might have been den of the bugbear but i said on the plain of Faerun. Now, of course Faerun is the continent on which Waterdeep and a lot of the forgotten realms adventures take place which is on the planet of checks notes toril or toril it's the third planet from the sun conveniently enough oh hey it's a good spot it's got it's got one moon it, it's earth it's it's fantasy earth that's that that's what it is but apparently you know you you drill down far enough past all the turtles and it's the prime material plane is if if there's a plane that i should be referencing that would it, it, it would be that one okay Good to know so there's lots of different planes i'm happy to hear that there's something underneath the turtles too right yeah because there's like all the positive and negative energy planes right yeah the great wheel there's a celestial plane right i think as far as i'm aware yeah yeah it's all it's all in there right mm -hmm. perfect okay now we know where we are <laughs> thank you commenters we see you and we read your comments should we start off talking about the bannings? I'm into that. So the biggest banning that sort of the banning so big it made the news, which is to say that it was briefly trending in the US, is Hull Breacher. So Hull Breacher was printed in a Commander Legends and it is two and a blue for a 3-2 Merfolk pirate with flash that says if an opponent would draw a card except the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, instead you create a treasure token. So they don't even get to draw it just becomes a treasure that you get instead and i mean that seems you know irritating but certainly not the most busted kind of card of this realm turns out real pain in the ass yeah yeah because it has flash yeah and so it has been uh banned in commander by the commander rules committee and there was much discussion brought on by that I obviously haven't played a lot of Commander recently, so I haven't encountered Hull Breacher, but... Yeah, no, it was... It's uh, the part of this blue hand attack suite. Well, blue-red, I guess, because you play it with literally every Wheel of Fortune ever printed, and your opponents pitch their hand, and then they draw nothing, and you get a bunch of treasure for it. And uh, yeah, with the two-card combo, you kind of lock your opponents out of the game. So you just... You play a wheel, and then you get a bajillion treasure, and presumably in the seven cards that you've drawn, you've drawn another wheel... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess to clarify for anyone keeping score at home who's not aware of what we mean when we say wheel effects is the card Wheel of Fortune is where we're um, pulling that nomenclature from. In the original Wheel of Fortune is two and a red sorcery. Each player discards their hand and draws seven cards. And so there are other cards like that, you know, like a Time Twister, I think. Obviously that's Power 9, but you know, there's cards that do this where it's, you know, you pitch your entire hand, but you draw that many cards, except in this case, you just you just pitch your hand and then whoever has the hull breacher gets gets all the treasure yeah and like you, you play it alongside cards like uh war of the spark narset but like narset as backbreaking as that play is at least has the pretense of being able to be attacked right <laughs> right and having to be played at sorcery speed right because you can also flash in hull, hull breacher in response to, to to opponent's effects so it's just you know it was this cornerstone of uh, CEDH and nobody liked it except for the people playing it. Womp womp. Yeah. And now it's gone forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It turns out if, if they ban something in Commander, they also just like go to everyone's houses and take all the copies and burn them. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when uh, I, I remember back when a new edition of Warhammer came out, that's what Games Workshop was doing. Nice. Right. Knock knock. Oh, here. I'm here to grind your figurines into dust. It's yep. the Games Workshop, man. Can't play with them anymore. 
And I mean, yeah, like uh, it's it's commander, the rule zero, but you just can't bring it to sanctioned events. Yeah, we asked, I don't actually know, I think it was James because we didn't actually talk about this. I don't know who it was who tweeted it, but somebody tweeted from our Twitter account <laughs> asking people sort of, you know, the Hull Breacher ban has us thinking, you know, what do you, what is your, you and your play groups do in terms of the, in terms of the ban list? And it was pretty, pretty divided actually, but I think the general consensus, if there was one, was that at a baseline, it's really nice for there to be an official ban list to look at so that you can, so th just as a, as a shorthand, right? Mm -hmm, so it's like, mm -hmm. Are you playing the official ban list? No? Okay, then we can, then let's talk. If it's like, yeah, I'm playing the official ban list. Cool, so am I. We know what to expect. Let's play. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And also just kind of like, no, that that, that sounds correct. I don't need to elaborate on that any further. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was a lot of people talking about, as you say, you know, like rule zero discussions and people having discussions about specific cards you know it's like yeah we you know my play group we're totally on board for the ban list except for this one card because no one in our group can actually do the the thing that is the reason that that card is there so we're fine with it sort of thing mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. seems reasonable mm -hmm. too yeah in this case i think it's reasonable to allow hull, hull breacher like say you want to you want to keep playing your hull breacher and you're not playing wheel effects and you're not playing it proactively right like hull breacher isn't a combo where you like launch off of a hull breacher make sure no one else has cards in their hand and then you get into your end game immediately and win. If you're just playing Hull Breacher as a kind of like cool counterspell for someone's tidings, like you can probably just tell your friends that and keep playing Hull Breacher. So for the rules committee, it's probably close because Notion Thief and Narset, as you mentioned earlier, have been around for a long time and the strategy is not brand new. Like the, the Nekasar commander archetype is like fairly popular and been around for a while. I think maybe the fact that it, yeah, it, because it provides mana instead of more cards or some other resource allows you like pretty reliable way to get into this play pattern where the game ends quick. You know, Notion Thief gives you extra cards, but you already get a bunch of cards with what you're doing with this deck. So getting the mana is kind of more valuable than getting the cards, I imagine. Yeah, well, I mean, like in a full commander pod, right? Nominally, you get what well, you draw seven cards and you get 21 treasure. Right. <laughs> right. That's uh, GG, I guess. <laughs> Right. You know, on these decks, I'm sure I'll play Notion Thief as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sometimes you're drawing like your whole deck and then just casting it immediately, which is pretty nuts. But yeah, Hull Breacher is a pretty messed up card. Like in, in 1v1 games, like in Canadian Highlander or when I've when we saw it in even in Commander Legends draft, it was just like, oh, yeah, that's a uh, that's pretty, pretty good spell there. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I mean, I have fond memories of Notion Thief mainly due to was was it the pro tour where uh there was a vintage play where somebody actually got to flash in notion thief against jace the mind sculptor's brainstorm ability i think there's a famous one on the scg tour scg right yeah and the commenter is mm -hmm. like ladies and gentlemen ladies and gentlemen it's about to happen right like they see the hall breacher they see the jace a hush falls over the crowd and then everyone cheered the dream of every dragon's maze player yeah but I mean, yeah, I'm I'm sure there are fair hull breacher plays. Yeah, I mean, if you're just putting in a deck that doesn't have draw sevens, like it's just another good blue card that's good mm -hmm. at fighting other blue cards, basically. Yeah, but it, it does kind of lend itself to this play pattern of locking your opponents out of the game and then winning. Which I mean, sure, the the point of playing EDH is to win the game, but eh, you know, this sucks. If you're curious, the other cards that the commander committee mentioned in their update were indeed notion thief and narset but mentioning that you know notion thief is more than one color narset is sorcery speed and so so far those are not necessarily posing the same kind of problem but that hull breacher just all the different things combined to make it very scary yeah now the second ban of the week is kind of interesting because you might not even be aware that there was a second ban if you don't play arena and i mean even then you might not really be aware but there's this format on arena called standard 2022 it's like a it's not permanent it's a cue that they're adding for a little while, I believe, just to so people can take an F and break from Throne of Eldraine. But basically what it is, is it's it's what standard will be when it rotates, except for the fall set, because when the first of the Innistrad fall sets comes out, that's when standard will rotate and then Throne of Eldraine and other sets, but Eldraine is the problem, rotates out. And so this is basically you can use anything on Arena that will be legal in standard 2022, except... <laughs> they had to ban a card from it they banned the book of exalted deeds 
please. And uh, let me read it to you and then explain why. Because we were discussing before the show and Cameron was, because you didn't know this, right? Yes. No, no. I, I saw bands and I was like, right, Hall Breacher's been banned. I know this. I don't need to do my research. <laughs> So the Book of Exalted Deeds is white, white, white for a legendary artifact. At the beginning of your end step, you gain if you gain three or more life this turn, create a 3-3 three, three white angel creature token with flying. Neat. What is relevant is white, 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 tap, exile the Book of Exalted Deeds, put an enlightened counter on target angel. It gains, you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game, activate this only as a sorcery. Also, not necessarily bad by itself, but there's another card that is legal in Standard 2022, which is from Kaldheim. It's Faceless Haven. So it's a land, snow land, taps for colorless, and for snow, 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 you can have it become a 4-3 creature with vigilance and all creature types until end of turn, and it's still a land. So you turn Faceless Haven into a creature. It is all creature types, meaning it is an angel. You activate Book of Exalted Deeds to put an enlightenment counter on this angel. Then at the end of your turn, it turns back into a land that still has this counter on it, and it still has, you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game, but it's a land, which which makes it very difficult for your opponent to interact with. Right. Then you just sit there until the game ends. Or or longer if yeah, if the if your opponent does the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really, it's a testament to how unplayable they've made land destruction over the years. I mean, this isn't anything new, but it's worth pointing out, like, you know, they, they just acknowledge in the article explaining this ban. It's like, yeah, we, you know, there's no way to really interact with your opponent's lands. And like, fair enough. Like, I mean, when the game started, you could interact with your opponent's stuff in any way. But, you know, now you can't. And then maybe that's overall probably for the best. Yeah. Reprint Avalanche Riders, right? Yeah. 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 Cube April fuming somewhere. Like I did like the wording of the ban announcement where they said, this deck was not dominant either by win rate or percentage of players playing it, but running into it was a very frustrating experience. And if both players were using it, the game would have no way to end until one player finally decided to concede. This is not the gameplay experience we are aiming to provide. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate Wizards seeing something they don't like and just going, oh, hell no. Yeah. No, absolutely not. And uh, they continue. It said, it should be noted, this ban does not mean that it will be banned in standard after format rotation with the release of Innistrad Midnight Hunt, because they say the standard 2022 Q is best of one. So there's no sideboarding. It's only on arena. And there's going to be a whole other set actually in standard after rotation. With sinkhole in it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what they're hinting at. That's yeah. what they're implying. That's right. Yeah. yeah. God, I can't mm -hmm. wait. Standard's going to be the best it's ever been. Strip mine reprint. Incoming. Give me Dark Ritual and Hypnotic Spectre and Strip Mine, please. Yeah. So the thing is, really, this is not, it's only really sort of news because they had to do this after launching the event because they've done sort of weird formats on Arena before, right? And the, it's like, it's standard, but there is no limit on card size. Yo, but Persistent Petitioners is banned. And, you know, you're look at it and you're like oh that yeah you know sure that, yeah, makes, that sense. makes sense so if they'd done this and been like it's standard 2022 yo but book of exalted deeds is banned because of this thing you'd be like oh all right sure yeah you know that tracks this is only sort of really like a thing because they launched it and then this happened and they were like oh we should ban that because again this is not a real real air quotes real it's not a real format so it's i don't really care i just think it's really interesting to talk about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean like it's kind of an interesting interaction yeah right? because i think i would have assumed that that counter would fall off when the land stopped being a creature but it does not mm -hmm. plus one plus one counters also don't fall off when land stop being creatures right exactly right also i don't even think it's a ability of the counter it's just yeah you just put an enlightened counter on it and it gains this ability so i don't actually know what the, I guess the counter is just to remind you. I did troll through some Reddit forums and my good buddy over in Vancouver, Judge Todd, has answered this really well for us. And yeah, though it surprises me, the enlightened counter is just there to remind you that this thing is there and it is the creature that gets the ability indefinitely from Book of the Zulk Deeds, which is like you know through the regular English language reading how it reads, like the, the most recent thing applied to the pronoun it to going back in the sentence is the angel. So that's fair. I'm just surprised that it's not the counter that gets this ability because the abil the counter doesn't really do anything. The reason I found this, if you move the counter off of it with the Ozolith, for example, it's still the first creature that used to have the counter on it that is preventing you from losing the game, not any other creature that ends up with that counter on it. Wild, that, right? That's honestly really fascinating. Yeah, this surprises me and feels counterintuitive. So I have not actually been playing that particular event because I've been spending... My arena time, which hasn't been huge in the past week or so, but I've been spending it 
playing Arena Limited. I think we talked, I can't remember when it was that we were talking about it, but I was like, blah, 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 whenever traditional sealed comes back or whenever they add that back in, uh, it's been here the whole time. It's just, you got to go looking for it. So I've been enjoying playing sealed with best of three. Uh, that's been much more successful for me than best of one sealed. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in best of three, it's easier to take a weaker pool to like the five and two or, you know, six and one. Mm hmm. Right. Because you, there, you can just play more magic and you can make adjustments and you get less dirted out by opponents wild stuff sideboarding's a whole thing speaking of wild stuff one of these events i had two opponents back to back had inferno of the star mounts which is an absolute disgusting bomb let me read it real quick four red red for a six six legendary dragon can't be countered flying haste and it has fire breathing but also when its power becomes 20 because of if you use its fire breathing enough if you pay 14 mana to give it 20 power then it deals 20 damage to any target that's less likely it's but it's a 6-6 flying haste with fire breathing so it's you know it's a way to lose <laughs> games of games of afr limited and so i had back-to-back -back opponents who had this card and both of them like cast it and put themselves in an absolutely commanding position in the game and then the turn that they cast it made attacks that put them dead on board oh that's nice for you yeah, yeah both time i was I was like, oh, crap. Well, there, there's the game. Wait, what? Oh, okie dokie. Like, it's very... I guess they got a... What do they call it when you have a firepower? The, 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 the mentally warping effect of having a lot of firepower on your side. I didn't know there's a name for that. That's great. Apparently, it's, it dates back to the Vietnam War. Okay. Where you're just like, we have this enormous gun and can't lose. Well, as it turns out... We can still lose to ourselves. Yep. As the Vietnam War has shown us. Is it just hubris? <laughs> right. It might be. It might be. Right. Like big gun hubris. I'm, I'm sure there's actually a very specific example, and I would love to know what that word is. But, you know, I think I read about it in Snow Crash. Oh, yeah. That tracks. I had just one opponent play themselves out of the game against me and i was like kind of mad when normally i'd be like hooray yes i get to win now but i was just like ah you like your cards are so good and you played so good right up until this turn when you attacked me down to two you know and yeah just, just frustrated i guess i guess as i age maybe i'm getting more and more interested in just get having a good game rather than when the the good feels from winning are starting to fade but the enjoyment of a bunch of difficult decisions in a row yeah and a satisfying conclusion one way or the other it is more rewarding which is weird I, i'm surprised to even hear myself say this sometimes when my opponent scoops like way way too early i'm like oh opponent no is that just because you wanted to play with your food more no like there, there's times when it's like obviously there are times when it's you know you play some sort of bomb or you're in such a commanding position and your opponent's just like ah, i don't need to deal with this and it's like okay you know fair but there's right. other times where it's like you've not even fully stabilized and your opponent just concedes and it's like well, I, maybe you had something to do i guess but it seems like way too early right it's like you mulligan and then you played like a two five on turn four and they have like yeah. five cards in hand and they're missing their fifth land drop but they have a bunch more stuff than you and like they have a bag of holding yeah and they scoop yeah yeah i've been there too it's also a little frustrating so have either of you apart from you know the pre-pre-release and then the fam jam and any time that we've been on stream or whatever played much limited draft or sealed yeah no i've been jamming sealed until i ran out of money which gives you some sense of how well it went but <laughs> Because, you know, sealed is when you build up your 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 gems for the rest of the season. That That's had not been my experience on Arena at all. I've no. been terrible at every sealed format. Like, of them. <laughs> okay, well, that makes me feel a little better then. Sorry. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm, I'm really enjoying the venture decks, such as they exist. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, the getting in for an early Tomb of Horrors... And just like taking the taking the six to the dome to get out a four four death touch. Tomb of Annihilation. Tomb yeah. of Annihilation, excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Tomb of Horrors is a different thing. Tomb of Annihilation, getting out the Atropian early and then swinging in with a five five death touch because absolutely give it the torch. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like you you bust the Atropian out of the Tomb of Horrors and send it on to the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Yeah. Solid play. <laughs> Shout outs to the art department at Arena. I love the presentation of venturing into a dungeon that it shows you the covers of these adventure books. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. God, I appreciate that so much. And then the little icon is specific to the one you're in. Yeah. It's the same same art. 
Yeah, it's so cool. Brief interjection here, listener. Uh, Cameron's computer had a something bad happen to it, and uh, he had to leave. For the benefit of you watching the video on YouTube, Cameron's avatar is going to sit here motionless for the rest of the video because it would be easier than me removing it. Thanks for joining us. All right. So Nelson and I are going to keep talking about playing AFR Limited. What dungeon do you typically find yourself going into and when? Oh, okay. So I almost always start on the lost mine of Fandelver. It's interesting to me to hear that Cameron tends to start on the Tomb of Annihilation. I do that if I'm ahead because it just, you know, it can do five to the dome, right? Like, or your opponent, it also puts your opponent on the spot to like make awkward decisions about their cards in hand and and then their land in play, right? Mm -hmm. So like it puts them in a, in a more of a bind if you're already beating down. So if you do happen to have like, I don't know, maybe once I've had like one drop the delver's torch turn three equip then and they have no creature yet like if they haven't played a creature and you you're on the play and they're about to have their turn three like sure go to the tomb of annihilation but i almost always start in the lost minds of fan delver because a few reasons your decks tend to care about completing a dungeon and it's tied for fastest basically with you know you i've never gone to the oubli yet <laughs> so you almost always go on the left hand side of the mm -hmm. tomb of annihilation so it's like four it's four rooms to get through right yeah and and then yeah you draw a card at the bottom which is like pretty compelling and the plus one plus one counter and then pro but probably the main reason is just that the very first room is usually the most reward like i find like getting the scry in the early game you know setting yourself up for the next turn feels much more powerful than losing a life or gaining a life so it's just the most exciting to start going down and then there's like as it's kind of like medium decent rewards for every room you go through the mind of Fandelver. yeah how about you i i, I don't know i i find myself trying to go in the mind of Fandelver the least interesting <laughs> I, okay I, I mean i i do still do it but i i find myself trying to avoid it because i i think that like either i'm in a very sort of aggressive deck this is less common i'm in an aggressive deck on the play and I've already put in like three or four damage and then I go in the tomb of annihilation and I just want to keep hammering my opponent or I have some sort of engine, some kind of repeatable engine. And so I want to go in the dungeon of the mad mage so that I can clear it and get the benefits of the runestone caverns, the room that lets you exile two cards and play them. And then the wizard's lair where you draw three and play one of them for free because my decks don't tend to have a lot of the cards that care about completing a dungeon, at least the ones that I've put together. <laughs> if I just have like some incidental venture, it's like, oh, you know what? I'll just go in the mind of Fandelver and if I finish it, then I finish it. But if I have like a dungeon deck with like uh, Delver's Torch on a creature with evasion or, you know, Wanty Fangblade with the Thieves tools so it's unblockable or Nadar if I'm lucky enough to get that one, you know, the or even just the dungeon map. Yeah, I like the map a lot. Yeah. yeah. Then I'm going to try to go for Dungeon of the Mad Mage just because the if I'm confident I can get far enough through it, the rewards are so much stronger on that particular dungeon. Okay, I like that. Yeah, that's, that's basically where I'm at too. Usually if I have some kind of reliable, repeatable way to get through the dungeon, I'll go to the Mad Mage. Although I still will often start on the mind of Fandelver even if I have those kinds of things because... You, you know, you can get through it quickly. It makes a chump blocker faster than anything else, you know, in case anything goes wrong. I find usually with these like repeatable dungeon, dungeon exploring decks, it's like the opponent might be up to something that doesn't look to be too aggressive. But after three turns of like going to the dungeon, it's like, well, they've been spending their time developing their board like a normal magic deck. So like they just might have more stuff than you. Mm. And and you might be like, well, on your way to completing the dungeon, the mad mage, but you're under a lot of pressure. And so you kind of have to like get that free spell to really really matter on the last chapter or last room of the dungeon or whatever or you might be dead so yeah i i often will be completing the lost mind of fendler first and then if i'm like okay i have a dungeon map i'm gonna do every turn and i'm not getting attacked for too much damage every turn i'll start going into the mad mage but yeah i i have i have done the tomb of annihilation a lot of times too mm. have there been any cards that potentially didn't look that exciting that once you started to actually play with them have have been like, oh, actually, this is pretty sweet. I like Dawnbringer Cleric because blowing up an enchantment is like a big deal. Like if you can blow up your opponent's class card, mm -hmm. that's 
often really big. That's almost exactly the card I was thinking of. Yeah, you, this card started off looking pretty innocuous and not great. And it's like, okay, so if you're in green-white life gain, it triggers to pump your unicorn or your like your golden uncommon, mm -hmm. or or it blows up their ranger class and saves you from dying super quick. So yeah, I actually like Dawnbringer Cleric a lot. Yeah, the Thieves tools, actually. Yep, me too. I like them from the get-go, though, yeah. Yeah, the fact that it comes with the treasure mm -hmm. is kind of a big deal because you can play Thieves tools on three on turn two and get your treasure and then on turn three you can you know you can hold your treasure until later i mean dropping a five drop on four is probably more powerful but you could do like turn three the what is it jaded cell sword oh right and get in with first strike and haste. The, yeah it's a four three dragon warrior and it, if you use a treasure it gets first strike and haste so you just sort of slam in remember the first strike because i definitely was like eh, i'm gonna trade my wanty fang blade for this no 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 yeah sure doesn't it will learn that one the hard way sometimes. The Secret Door, speaking of, about like both cards that looked a little better than I initially thought and also can repeatedly go into the dungeon. This is mm -hmm. a common 04 for 4 with 5, pay 5, which is a lot. But I don't know, these, especially the dungeon decks, like they're they're trying to set up to go into the long game. So just any any repeatable ways to get into the dungeon, you know, it's nice to stack your deck with X runs. This one isn't the best, but 4 is a fair bit of toughness in this format. Yeah. You know, oftentimes you're just trying to hold off you know, two or three, two and three power creatures at the same time. So it does that pretty well. Yeah, I also like the Thieves tools quite a bit. You find a Cursed Idol. I might have mentioned that I was like kind of impressed with this card. Again, it can blow up an enchantment. And as we were just saying, it makes a treasure. So there's still like a lot of cards that make treasure incidentally or as a bonus. And yeah, yeah turns out that's really good. Yeah. I mean, I've also quite enjoyed, I mean, I again, in the same sort of realm, I think just most of these you have a thing happen modular cards are, mm -hmm. are pretty good i actually i've quite enjoyed you see a pair of goblins oh, okay i haven't gotten that one yet yeah so it's either you get two it's three in a red instant and you either befriend them and you get two one one red goblins or you charge them and then your creatures get plus two plus oh until end of turn so it's a trumpet blast effect right and yeah i've i've found i've built red decks that both sides of that have been have been useful getting to like you know make make a goblin like you make some goblins maybe block something or maybe use a goblin to feed into a sepulcher ghoul so that my zombie ogre ventures into the dungeon at the end of turn or just going wide and then using a second one of these to like hit hit very hard nice turns out having choices is generally pretty pretty all right I like the Reaper's Talisman maybe more than I should. Like it's been sort of a little pet card. This is a one black equipment. Whenever a creature, the equipped creature attacks, it gains death touch, which is kind of weird, but it's like good for the black green make creatures die on your own turn decks because it's like yeah. your death touch creature, you know, you can you can put it on a higher power creature and then they don't want to not block it, but they're definitely losing a creature if they do. Or or maybe you're trading, but either way, creatures die. Mm. And then also when the equipped creature attacks, defending player loses two life and you gain two life. So you could get it into like there's sort of a hidden black white life gain deck or black green life gain deck because like it's like mm -hmm. there's some there's some black cards that gain life and then there's white and green payoffs for life gaining. Weird thing about Reaper's Talisman. Mm-hmm that happened unfortunately to to an opponent of mine is that the the equipped creature doesn't just get death touch right it, it just gets death touch when it attacks right yeah there's this weird trigger that's yeah. when it attacks and so i don't remember exactly what it was but they had the what creature was it was it a pack tactics thing i think there was a there's a creature oh no i remember what it was i'm sorry they had the there we go spare dagger okay so equipment Single mana equipment, single mana equip. The equipped creature gets plus one plus O oh, and has whenever this creature attacks, you may sacrifice spare dagger. When you do, this creature deals one damage to any target. Oh no, and they don't have they don't have triggers ordered. Or they have triggered sort of automatically, maybe. Correct. So they yeah. put the spare dagger on their creature, they attacked with it, then they popped the spare dagger to target my huge thing, but the ability of the talisman had not yet resolved, so uh. the creature didn't have death touch, so they didn't kill my creature. So and dirty. Yeah, they said oops, and probably, probably not going to make that mistake again. But yeah, definitely go into your arena settings and uncheck auto order triggered abilities it doesn't come up a lot generally it's just one more click for you but uh, when it matters it's kind of important yeah I, I also have that one set to turn off i can't remember what it was it was a previous set maybe in strict saving there was something where i was just like oh i gotta i gotta stop auto ordering triggers because it's, yeah. it's it'll lose you the game and then it's it's funny because it is kind of annoying but it's hard to remember to to check that setting before you start playing a game 
Barbarian class is sweet. We got to see basically its full potential out of Ben's deck back, back at the PPR, but it's like, you know, not that uncommon, I think, to get a sealed deck where the Barbarian class is going to be pretty great or like you're putting together green, red or blue, green. Barbarian class with Pixie Guide. Yeah. And you get, you roll three dice. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. I've had, I had that in a game on my yeah. home stream a little while ago. Oh, have we talked about how there's basically a Splinter Twin combo? Oh, no. In the format? Is that in... Or, it requires a rare. Is that the yeah. rare red creature when it attacks? So Delina, Wild Mage, is three and a red. And whenever Delina attacks, choose a creature you control and then roll a d20. If you roll one to 14, you create a tapped and attacking token copy of that creature that gets exiled at the end of combat. It's also not legendary if you target a legendary creature. So you can actually target Delina as well if you want. Right, yeah. But you won't get triggers off of the Delina copy because that copy is already attacking. Or... If you roll 15 to 20, you create one of those tokens and then you get to go again. You may choose to roll again. You don't have to. But if you have Pixie Guide in play as well, Pixie Guide is one in a blue for a 1 3 fairy with flying with grant an advantage. If you would roll one or more dice, instead roll that many dice plus one and ignore the lowest roll. So basically, what you do is you have Pixie Guide in play and you attack with Delina, and you target a Pixie Guide, and you get to roll two dice. So the chances of you hitting 15 to 20 are fairly good, because you're rolling right. you're rolling twice. It's more like 50-50 rather than 75, or maybe yeah. better than 50-50 maybe. I don't actually. Shout us out in the comments if you know how this math works. And then you get to roll again. And if you manage to do it the first one time, then you have two Pixie Guides. So then when you roll again, you're rolling three dice, thereby increasing your advantage. And at that point, every Pixie Guide that you add adds another dice at which point it's very very unlikely to fail and so you just keep rolling dice and making more and more pixie guides until you say stop because it is a may and then you just you have you know 20 pixie guides tapped and attacking your opponent and then hold the and, phone and they're dead whoa 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 here graham we don't stop when when we feel like we have enough pixie guides we stop because arena crashed after the 30th pixie guide we made because every <laughs> single one of those dice is an animation that rolls on your tiny mobile phone and your entire battlefield is covered with little red dice rolling em emotes that just break the whole program and now you're back on your home screen thinking about whether you want to just tell your friends or you want to try to reboot arena but either way that game's done yeah i wouldn't try this on mobile if you can avoid it <laughs> We don't all have that luxury. I'm playing Magic at the Beach while I also watch my kids. You know how it is. Yeah, fair enough. I like Check for Traps. It's just a neat, different kind of hand attack spell. One generic and a black sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. Exile that card. If an instant or, or a card with flash is exiled this way, they lose one life. Otherwise, you lose one life. We're used to losing one life when we thought seize our opponent or losing two life, you know, from the actual thought seize. But various life loss is connected with hand attack and all, all things black card. But it, I think this is maybe the first one where you get to, like, take their card and also hurt them, which is kind of cool. And just the way it, you know, it's flavorful, the way they've, they've done it, where it's like if you can get the kill spell out of there, then, you know, they lose a life and, mm. yeah, check for the traps. Check for traps is kind of like the idea of a lot of decks that are playing hand attack spells plan. It's sort of like taking the place of the green hexproof instant or the the blue counter spell right mm -hmm. like trying to make sure that your stuff gets to do what you want it to do yeah i i want to while we're in talking about black cards i want to also talk about deadly dispute which okay. is one in a black instant as an additional cost to cast the spell sacrifice an artifact or creature draw two cards and create a treasure token so i think draw two cards and create a treasure token that would be enough to pay one more generic mana over village rights but the fact that you can also sacrifice an artifact so if you already have a treasure which often this deck will then you can just be like oh i'm just going to sacrifice this treasure and then i get it back immediately so you don't have to like you can you can keep it as like removal insurance if your opponent tries to kill one of your creatures but very often i'll be i've been like you know thieves tools on turn two then not drawn a third land and been like all right cool well i'll just sack that treasure and then draw two cards and the treasure replaces itself like it's just the the fact that you can sacrifice a treasure as that artifact is pretty nice and then you can draw like you know you can draw your third land and another deadly dispute and then you can just do that again <laughs> that is true it's quite the turn three yeah, well, well you can't use the treasure to pay for the deadly dispute oh right yeah you're right no you're right you're right i, I made a mistake earlier i made a mistake just now but uh, but i made a mistake in the game because i'm thinking about this card as always wanting to sacrifice a treasure token and that's the end of the treasure token interaction with deadly dispute right i gotta pay two mana and then have a treasure token i'm willing to 
sacrifice. Right. And then I totally forgot that it also replaces itself with a treasure token. And so I could have like cast one more spell that turn or something. But yeah, I agree. This card is quite good. So overall, I've I've been very much enjoying this sealed and draft format. Like this, I mean, like I I appreciate all the, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons references and stuff like that. We've we've talked about that and we'll talk about that a bit more in some future episodes. But, you know, that's been nice. But as a set of magic, this is pretty sweet. Yeah, absolutely. The perhaps unsurprisingly, the venture into the dungeon mechanic is super cool for limited and the dice rolling is kind of neat. I think the dice rolling is more sort of like just some fluff and flavor, although it is also like the core of a bunch of decks. Yeah, I think I do think it's an exciting limited format. I'm happy that we're playing it. I'm looking forward to playing it more in the future. I'm like a little disappointed that the adventuring into the dungeon is mostly an Esper because that's just like what I'm way more drawn in by. And so I like haven't been drafting the red and green decks very much. Mm. But but I had it's not that I haven't been losing to them. It's not that there aren't good red and green cards and and they still have cool D D flavor so i'm sure i'll get around to it once i'm pushed in there by some sort of bomb yeah the the pack tactics is not necessarily like a backbreaking ability in and of itself but just red and green like is just good like there's just some good decks there too well we don't have a really smooth segue this week but hey we'd like to thank you for listening to this week's podcast and if you'd like to get yourself a copy of triumphant adventure or maybe some draft boosters if you live in the states of DD afr mtg head on over to cardkingdom.com com forward slash lrr let them know we sent you and you might just get yourself a little one inch button that says big oof big oof also to cameron's computer we hope that it will rise again from whatever (laughs) has befallen it right hope your computer is okay soon cameron yeah and uh, we want to also thank you and all of you who support us on patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run until next time i've been graham uh, with nelson hi i'm still here (laughs) cameron was here earlier jordan edits these heather gets them online and and you all listen and thank you for doing that we'll talk to you next time miss you cam bye